brother, my sister, for action. Today, my brother, my sister, we are talking. And this class is going to last nine minutes exactly. Today, we are talking about George W. Lee. Reverend George W. Lee. Reverend George W. Lee. And I'm most excited to be with you, my brother, my sister. Now, you can see his photograph right here, the African history class. He was a bulky man, full of energy and power. Now, my brother, my sister, George W. Lee was born on the 25th day of December in 1903. Six years before Kwame Nkrumah was born. On Christmas Day, he was born. And he was born in Edwards, in the American state of Mississippi. He was born to a father who was so abusive. His mother was a plantation worker. His father used to beat his mother day in and day out. He was a drunk who was a coward who would only come home with anger and fury and bitterness inside him. After he was insulted and maltreated in the several beer bars he went to, he would come and vent his spleen on this innocent woman. When he was born on the 25th day of December in 1903, in Edwards in Mississippi, his father now decided to marry his mother after he was born. And the marriage took place. The woman loved him. She believed that she would be able to change him. Oh, but no, the abuse was severe. She died, my brother, my sister, when he was still very young. Today we are talking about George W. Lee. George Wesley Lee is the full name. George Wesley Lee. Lee as in L-W-E. My brother, my sister, born in Edwards, uh, Mississippi, on December 25, 1903. He grew up also in a very hard way because his mother was dead when he was only a young boy. He started to work very hard on the banana docks, carrying load and cleaning just to lead a life. Now he was able to be part of a school and when he joined the school he learned how to do typing and also how to do typesetting. In no time he graduated as a secretary who knew how to print at the same time how to type and how to do typesetting. He decided that he would work in the press. But these were the days of the Great Depression during the 1930s. Our hero was only about 27 years old. My brother, my sister, when he hit the road, working very hard as a hustler, he saw how black people were suffering on the streets of America. He saw how pets were even treated better than black people on the streets of Mississippi, where he was born. He saw how black people were shot and killed temporarily. And of course momentarily without getting any justice whatever oh amazingly he decided to ask himself what black people have done wrong so that pets of white people were even better and more rated and valued than the lives of black people <laughs> black people lived in extreme poverty as farm workers, Lee continued to work to improve himself. He joined with local black businesses and community leaders, serving the community. Now he had a calling to become a pastor. And he picked up the Bible, read the Bible from page to page, back to back. He taught himself the Bible. And then he became a pastor of the local Baptist church in his neighborhood in Mississippi. And people love to listen to him preach. He preached the gospel. He also taught Pan-Africanism. At the same time, he taught black people to be very, very patient. But at the same time, be proud of themselves and who they come from. Where they come from. I beg your pardon. He told black people, you are the eyes of God. And the day that you look down upon yourself, you are looking at the pride of God in a negative way. My brother, my sister, in the African-American community he lived in, almost every day, 
Police would come in and shoot people dead. And there would never be any justice for these people. He started a strong activism. Lee was the first black man in memory to register to vote in Humphreys County in Mississippi, where blacks were a majority of the population but had been effectively disenfranchised by provisions of the 1890 Constitution, particularly due to white implementation of poll taxes and literacy tests in America in those days in the 1930s during the Great Depression. You are to pay poll tax to be able to vote in elections. And black people were disenfranchised. They were not allowed to vote. Our hero for today, George W. Lee, decided to get black people to vote and also to pay their poll tax. But the sheriff of the area, the chief of police, refused to take taxes from black people because... He considered them as animals, in fact, worse than animals. Animals don't pay taxes. Why should black people want to pay taxes? But the activism was very huge. They went to court and they won. Black people were supposed to vote. My brother, my sister, our hero for today became the first black man to be legally registered to vote in Mississippi. And when it was done, he was targeted by white people in the area and beyond, including the Ku Klux Klan. Here what happened now? Now when the sheriff refused to accept their poll taxes, which were required for voter registration, they took him to court. Now between them, Lee and courts registered nearly all of the country's countries, 90 black voters in 1955. And mark the date, 1955, that was the year. All black people in the neighborhood were registered to vote, those who paid their poll tax. The courts forced them to take the poll tax. My brother, my sister, our hero, was also in the printing business. He published a lot of stories about black people, and he exposed the wickedness of white people in the days of the Great Depression. Hear me now. He moved from place to place. After preaching the Bible, he will talk about black people, talk about Africa, and talk about the rights of black people. He was becoming very, very popular in the eyes of black people, yet he was becoming infamous in the eyes of the white minority in his area. <laughs> Our hero for today, George W. Lee became the vice president of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, a leading black organization in the state. Now the council promoted self-help, business and civil rights. It pressed for voting rights and social justice. It organized a boycott of gas stations that refused to install restrooms for blacks and was successful. Black people were not allowed to sit in the same buses as white people. They went to court and fought that. There were no bathrooms and toilets for black people in the open, like at gas stations and so on and so forth, and even malls and shops. Black people went to court, led by W. We, and they were able to get it done. George W. Lee. Here what happened now? Now he was targeted, and in April, Lee spoke at the council's annual meeting, which drew a crowd of more than 7,000 black people to the all black town of Mount Bayou right there in Mississippi 7,000 people and they listened to him talk blackness they listened to him talk black pride oh my god Lee's down home dialogue and his sense of political timing were said to have electrified the crowd pray not for your mom and pop Lee suggested they have gone to heaven pray you can make it through this hell my brother, my sister, he was quoted as saying, as for your mother and father, they have already made it to heaven. Now you have to pray that you are able to make it through this hell. And by hell, he meant the hellish situation that white people were taking black people through. And this speech, my brother, my sister, annoyed the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, it annoyed white people in America and they targeted him. Less than a month after this famous speech, Lee was driving on the streets of Belzoni, where he was born, in Mississippi, in his car. When a man pulled up close to his car and through the window of his car, 
He opened fire on him, shot him in the jaw, shattered his jaw, shot him in the head, shattered his brains, and the car veered off the road and crashed on the side of the road. When the police came on, the sheriff first and foremost said it was a traffic accident. <laughs> How could this have been a traffic accident with bullets in the head of the driver? The NWACP decided to take it to court and there were several investigations going on. Now the Sharif governor spared them on. My brother, my sister, and I'm talking about white people to resist blacks trying to fight for their rights right there in Mississippi. It was all a racist police, my brother, my sister. Now, Lee's funeral in Belzoni, his hometown attracted reporters from major black newspapers. His widow, uh, Rose Bird, decided to have an open casket to reveal how her husband had suffered Emil Till's mm, same suffering, my brother, my sister. Everybody came to see the shattered brains. Everybody saw the shattered jaws. My brother, my sister, and readers of the Chicago Defender shared Rosebud Lee's outrage by viewing a photo of her husband's body. Everybody came to see the brains that were shattered and the jaw that was broken into pieces. More than 1,000 people attended and they were allowed to take photos so the whole world would see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Civil rights activists said the Delta looking for evidence to find the killers. Medgar Evers, remember we talked about him a couple of days ago, uh, reputedly cut his teeth on the Lee case, continually feeding information to the press. Despite the efforts of activists, interest began to wane and the FBI investigation was eventually closed. Agents had identified credible white suspects but said that potential evidence appeared afraid to talk. No charges were ever brought against any suspect for Lee's murder. But today, we remember one of our own who laid down his life to have black people exercise their rights. He laid down his life to see black people in Mississippi and the whole of America and the whole of the world have some respect on their name. Oh, today we remember you, Papa. <laughs> Papa uni nyaminko Papa uni nyaminko wate Yeah papa Mezi fami kwa wate Papa mezi mini ubeko Papa uwe ya Naka fami kwa ye Papa naka kacha ya sobe kwa ye Yeah papa Papa uni nyaminko Papa, me see me new go, Papa. Yeah, Papa. Who need me go, Papa? Papa, me see me new go, Papa. Oh, Papa. Papa, me see me new go. Yeah. He died, my brother, my sister. He died, my brother, my sister, because he advocated to have black people's rights preserved. He died at the age of 51. Today we remember this great black soul, a reverend who took the fight from off the pulpit and brought it all the way to the streets to see black people survive. How many pastors and how many men of God in the Christian domain care about black people's rights? How many of them care about justice? How many of them fight corruption and wickedness and racism? Today we remember you, Papa. Tutu, 